Welcome to the BCV Podcast. I am your host, Pastor Seiko Woods. Glad to have you here. Please do the following for me. Please like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell at the bottom of this video. That way, whenever I go live, post any content or information that I would love for you to see, you'll be the one of the first to view it. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry financially, uh, you can do so by clicking the donation options below this video. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry through our BCV merchandise, you can do that as well. I want to get right into what I had left off on last week, uh, part one of the Black Church. Uh, thank those of you who had watched it, who went through those three hours of uh, viewing with me. I do appreciate that. Thank you all for the super chats. Thank you all for the love gifts. Thank you all for the words of encouragement and appreciation. Uh, as you know, there's been some uh, technical difficulties that I've been experiencing these past several weeks, uh, which is, which has prompted me to do pre-recorded videos until I'm able to get uh, my streaming situation resolved. Hopefully will be uh, by the uh, end of this week, hopefully by this weekend, I'll have everything up and running and good to go. Uh, be going through fiber optics instead of just using the coaxial cable. I am done with that. So, uh, but definitely appreciate your patience. Thank you all for the support. Again, it is so appreciative. So appreciative. Thank you so, so much for that. I want to just cover a few things um, before we get started and laying out the content, of course. Fair use, copyright disclaimer, under Title 17 U.S.C. Section 107, allowances made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, and scholarship and research. Fair use is permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. So, again, as we as I left off on last the last video that we uh, were together going through uh, the Black Church uh, in Part One. Uh, I discussed and shared with you uh, how far the church has gone and why I believe the, the, the black church as we know it, the modern black church, uh, the modern secular worldly church. I know God has a remnant of black churches out there, but the numbers are very small. But the overall majority of our black churches is trash. It is just straight trash. And no one has to or no one should even want to argue that point. All we have to do is look at most Christian radio stations, listen to most Christian radio stations, watch what is considered to be Christian TV, watch these professing Christians on, on podcasts like The Breakfast Club and others will just not have a godly representation or a biblical worldview when it comes to issues of morality and how we are to think and believe and behave as Christians. And unfortunately, this has been an ongoing cycle. But God is raising up people in his church and in his body that will sound the alarm and that will speak truth to error, speak truth to heresy and heretics that seek to lead people astray and to cause God's people to be in error and sometimes to their own detriment and to destruction. So it is my responsibility and it is my job whenever situations arise that come across my desk or come across my feed or come across to my attention that I respond to it if I believe that the issue or situation necessitates that. And I believe this one does. I believe this one does. We have people now that are praising, that are encouraging, that are voting, and even boldly, unapologetically, unashamedly, giving their public tacit support to people whose views are against the word of God. Views like abortion, marriage, sexuality, where people are now approving that which is evil and that which is evil, people are lauding it as good. And we know that that goes against the teachings of Scripture, Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. And so we need to not be discouraged. We need not to throw up our hands and say, oh, forget it. We just wait till the Lord returns. No, while the Lord is tearing in his return. We don't lose heart. His tearing does not mean he's not going to return. So he wants us to occupy until he returns. He wants us to make good of the time that he has given to us. He wants us to make disciples. He wants us to stand on the wall. He wants us to preach the word in season and out of season. He wants us to do what he has commissioned and left us here to do until he returns. And so one of the things he's called us to do is to protect the church. To protect God's people. To help God's people. You know, one of the things, one of the byproducts of love 
is that love does not seek its own. If this was all about me, I wouldn't waste my time doing this. But this is not about me. This is about the body of Christ. And there are so many of you just like me who see the corruption, who see the issues that we are talking about and have been discussing here on this channel and on others. And you're wondering, what, what can you do? Do what God has called you to do. If he's called you to be a watchman, be a watchman. He's called you to evangelize, which he's called all of us to do, then do that. But do what the Lord has commissioned for us to do in his word. He has called us to make disciples. He's called us to be ambassadors. We represent him, not ourselves. And so anytime we see people who've named the name of Christ and they misrepresent the kingdom of God, that is a black, that gives a black eye to Christ, to his church, and it makes the body of Christ look bad. And we can't do that. And so it's one thing when the world approves abortion. It's one thing when the world makes excuses for sin. But it's a totally different thing when we have people who proclaim to know God when they do it. And again, this is why I believe the black church as a whole is trash. Just throw the whole thing away. Throw the whole church away. Of course, God has his remnant. But the vast majority of the black church don't love God. They don't honor God. They don't see what God considers to be serious sins, serious sins. They 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 minimize it. They make excuses for it instead of make confessions. And so, again, the black church, just trash it. Straight garbage. Throw it in the garbage. Now, this is part two. So last time we were together, I, we were I went through the video with about Pastor Damon Richardson. And um, what I want to do, I want to highlight a portion of that video that I believe out of all the things that were said in, in his video that he did uh, last week, how he described babies that were considered to be monstrosities, deformed, you want to call them ugly babies or whatever the case might be, undesirable babies. I believe statements like that feed the narrative and supports the narrative of Margaret Sanger's agenda and her dream to eradicate the black community. And she speaks about useful idiots. And I believe Damon Richardson, along with people like Raphael Warnock, people like William Murphy, T.D. Jakes, and others are useful idiots. And maybe even your pastor, if they're supporting policies and platforms that go against God's word, especially when it comes to issues of family, when it comes to issues of morality, when it comes to issues of abortion, when it comes to issues of sexuality, if they are if they are towing the line for a party, particularly a Democrat party whose views are antithetical to the scriptures, they may be, or I would believe that they are useful idiots. And you'll see what I'm talking about as I go over some information and 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 read some uh, some articles and some sections of books that I want to recommend and put also in the bottom of this video uh, as well. So let's get let's get right into it. Let's get started. Go ahead, share my screen and, and make sure that we um, have everything audibly cued and ready to go. Again, this I'm just going to uh, highlight a section of this video, replay a portion of this video, and I want to talk about and and pick up where I left off at because I told you last time that there there was more information I wanted to give, but we were going to three hours approaching three hours into the last stream, and so I didn't want to. Uh, go any further than that. Hopefully, I want to keep this crunched in within within you know no more than no more than two hours, if not less than that. So, uh, appreciate your attention and your patience with that. So, let's get right into it. Pastor Damon Richardson, he's explaining he believes how abortions can be biblically necessary. And in part one, if you haven't watched part one, I would encourage you to watch it because I don't want to go to too much review. But there's no biblical reason to murder a child, none. If the, if the child by God's providence and sovereignty dies on their own, that's different, but that's not an abortion. But the unlawful, willful taking or calculated taking and premeditated taking of a life is not, a, it is not birth control. It is not health care. It is murder. It is murder. And we've already made that clear in part one. But let's, let, let's, let's listen to uh, Pastor Damon Richardson and hear what he has to say, again, for the sake of review, and then we'll pick up on uh, where we left off with more information that I want to share with you. I don't agree. I don't believe in abortion. I, I think abortion, I believe biblically that abortion is immoral. 
Uh, there are very few acceptable reasons for it. Obviously, if if a, if 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 it's a mother has, it needs to save her life, we got a aborted baby, or the mother's going to die. That would be an acceptable reason for it. There are acceptable reasons for it, mind you. If 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 the what is born is a complete monstrosity, and that does happen every now and again, yeah, that would be because it doesn't ha- it won't have any viable life. We're born alive, but it's a monstrosity. And that's what we want to pick up on from there. If your baby, if you've had a baby or your child is deformed of any fashion, if you believe that or consider, according to what this man just said, a complete monstrosity, that that is a biblical reason for, for abortion, that is biblically acceptable. But, but notice, notice. He never gave book, chapter, verse. He never gave a scriptural reference to that. He never gave any biblical support behind his basis on why he believes that the taking of a life because it is not, quote unquote, useful, because that's what viable means. That it it won't be able to be sustained. It won't it won't be useful. According to who, Damon? According to who? There's one example in scripture that I want to I want to read. And this is in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 to 23. I know we, we know that this is under the, the old covenant. This is dealing with the nation of Israel, Israel, but the principle still rings true for us today because God shows us how he values life, not just the life of those outside of the womb, but those inside of the womb. Verse 22, Exodus chapter 21, it reads, if men struggle with each other, and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no injury. He shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. Verse 23. But if there is any further injury or if there is injury, then you shall appoint life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound. Bruise for bruise. So notice the Bible says, God said, there is injury. So let's just say there's injury and this injury causes this baby now to be deformed. What does the, what does God say with that is to happen? What, what should happen to, to the baby? Look at, let's look at verse 23. If there is any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Does the Bible teach teach that the baby should be aborted? Does the Bible teach that the baby should be discarded as trash? Or does the Bible give value and dignity to that life that may have been injured, maimed, disfigured, whatever the case may be? Whatever that injury resulted in the physical effect or deformation of that baby do we see the scriptures teach at all that the baby is to now be discarded is to be treated as trash as refuse or does god hold the individual who inflicted the injury responsible i think we all know the answer to that because what if the baby is considered to be unviable God didn't say you kill it. God didn't say that you throw it away as though it's nothing. It is a person. It is a human being. It is made in the image and likeness of God. And so God's word makes it clear on how we are to treat life in the womb. There's this article. Now, we'll put these links up in the in the description below. This article uh, says, what percentage of abortions are medically necessary? October 1st, 2021, uh, the writer says the answer, the short answer to this question is zero. Medical science has progressed to the point where an abortion is never necessary to preserve the life or health of the mother. This has been true for more than half a century. Abortions performed to preserve the life or the health of the mother are so rare 
that they do not register statistically, according to Alan Guttmacher of Planned Parenthood, who did more to promote and spread abortion on demand throughout the world than any other individual. In 1967, he, comment, he commented, quote, today it is possible for almost any patient to be brought through pregnancy alive unless she suffers from a fatal disease such as cancer or leukemia. And if so, abortion would be unlikely to prolong, much less save the life, end quote. Where both the mother and child are ill, both should be treated. And every effort should be made to save both mother and child. The American Association Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists states that the term, quote, abortion to save the life of the mother, end quote, is deliberately misleading terminology. And that no abortion saves the life of the mother. Rather, one treats both parties. For instance, prematurely delivering the baby may be an option if the mother is gravely ill. And the AAPLOG acknowledges that in some cases, the baby may be too premature to survive. How common are such conditions? Naturally, the percentage of abortions allegedly performed to save the life or health of the mother will vary somewhat based on country. But we can see from the testimony of doctors and researchers that these cases are exceedingly rare. Even abortionists testify that there is a medical emergency, that if there is a medical emergency, the course of action is to deliver the baby prematurely because to go through the stages required by a surgical abortion, laminaria, stretching the cervix, etc., would cause more, not less damage to the mother. As far back as 1981, former general, former surgeon general of the United States, Dr. C. Everett Coop said, quote, the fact of the matter is that abortion is an as a necessity to save the life of the mother is so rare as to be non-existent end quote he was backed up by reformed abortionist bernard nathanson who said not long after quote the situation here a situation excuse me where the mother's life is at stake where she where, where she to continue a pregnancy is no longer a clinical clinical reality given the state of modern medicine we can now manage any pregnant woman with any medical affliction sex, sex successfully to the natural conclusion of pregnancy the birth of a healthy child end quote there are several conditions that pose a threat to the mother's physical health and mental health which may arise during pregnancy these are often presented as necessitating an abortion when they do not as former abortionist dr anthony Levitino has confirmed, quote, during my time at Albany Medical Center, I managed hundreds of such cases by terminating pregnancies to save mothers lives. In all those cases, the number of unborn children that I had to deliberately kill was zero, end quote. Dr. Levitino, in these cases, quote, terminated, end quote, the pregnancies he managed by delivering the babies early. problem with the label medically necessary. The term, quote, medically necessary, end quote, is nothing more than a ruse used by the abortion industry to justify abortions of convenience. As we explained above, the AAPLOG has said that the term medically necessary, quote, unquote, is deliberately misleading. In fact, Pro-abortion legislators use this vague term to enact laws that allow abortion on demand. Studies by the Guttmacher Institute, the world's leading pro-abortion research organization, show that only from 1% to 3% of all abortions are performed for medical reasons. But well over 90% are performed for economic or social convenience reasons. One point that this study by the AGI demonstrates is that medical necessity is not even considered by the vast majority of mothers who intend to abort. Although not the primary goal of the study, it is clear from the data presented that more developed countries have far fewer claims than abortion is medically necessary. Kenya with 20% claiming this is the main reason and Finland with only 0.6%. In fact, in the United States, abortions are performed most often for reasons of convenience, such as finances or relationship status. 
We frequently see examples of this abuse of terminology in the rationalizations offered by those arguing in favor of abortion. As the Catholic News Agency reports, Professor Lucia A. Celestia of the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law has pointed out that, quote, there is no requirement for a doctor to even consider whether or not there exists an alternative to abortion that could solve the medical crisis, end quote. The language of the legal statutes clearly has been twisted to make abortion freely available for any reason. Using medical necessity as legislative terminology allows lawmakers to craft bills that have large loopholes defining what such risk means. By tugging at our heartstrings with a purely emotional appeal, pro-abortionists argue that we cannot possibly refuse to help mothers all over the world. Pro-abortion organizations vastly inflate the numbers of abortions, create statistics on maternal mortality out of thin air, and basically use this as a means towards abortion on demand. Dr. Robert Nathanson, abortionist turned pro-lifer and co-founder of the National Abortion Rights Action League, has described this tactic in detail. Should expect that this percentage of life-threatening pregnancies will only decrease as modern medicine continues to make progress in saving mothers from these tragic complications. We should therefore be progressing toward policies that treat both mother and child as has always been the ideal. Namely, we must provide all ordinary means of keeping both the mother and the child alive. And the scope of these ordinary means expands as medicine progresses. The key to handling these situations is simply to acknowledge the humanity of both the mother and of the child. What to do in rare cases? Again, abortion to save the mother should never happen. Therefore, in the increasingly rare cases where continuing the pregnancy causes real and immediate danger to the mother, the baby ought to be removed in such a way that every effort is made to preserve its life outside of the womb. In such a case, both mother and baby are treated because their lives are of equal value. If the baby should die after a premature delivery, the physicians have done all they could, all they could to save his or her life. They have not deliberately killed the baby. Creamy survivor rates are improving constantly. Even if a delivery occurred at a time when the baby was likely not viable, the fundamental difference is still the intent behind the act. And that's what it is, Damon. It's the intent. Just to say something is not viable and therefore you just you just kill it. It's not biblical. It is never morally permissible to intend an evil outcome. And the death of an unborn child is most certainly an evil outcome. Now read one thing in here. This is a, a, a footnote. I want to read the footnote here. You're going to find this rather interesting. Um, because in this article, you're going to find a statement in this article by someone that I find to be rather, rather shocking. And, and, and it further solidifies the case why we as Christians, we don't support the murder of innocent human beings, i.e. babies. But the conclusion of this article states this. The percentage of abortions that are performed out of medical necessity is a dynamic statistic. But in the United States, cases of true medical necessity are exceedingly rare or non-existent. They are in no way a justification for abortion. The rare cases when the mother and child cannot be saved should not be called medically necessary abortions because effort is made to preserve both the lives of child and mother. In these instances, the only way to save the mother is by delivering, not killing the baby. So in, in, in foot number five, I want to read this. It says, as one typical example, during my 2004 HLI mission trip to Trinidad and Tobago, the head of Planned Parenthood in that country stated at a public meeting that 350 women in, to, in, Trinidad, in Trinidad and Tobago were killed by illegal abortions every year. I asked him. 
after the presentation where where his where this number came from. He replied that some months ago there was a documented case of a woman dying of a botched abortion in Port of Spain. There are seven hospitals in TNT, he said. Therefore, seven hospitals times 52 weeks in a year was about 350 deaths due to illegal abortions every year. And so this is this is why I'm concerned about and why I question the morality or the salvation of individuals who claim to be Christians and can support acts, wicked acts like this is because it is wicked. It because God hates it. He hates the shedding of innocent blood. So when I when I see tweets like this from Raphael Warnock on Twitter, June 24th of this year, where he says, quote, I'm outraged by the Supreme Court's decision. You know, the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and give the authority back to the states and not federally fund the murder of innocent human beings with our tax dollars. This is what this man is outraged and angry about. He says, I'm outraged by the Supreme Court's decision. You would think as a pastor and a Christian who professes to be a Christian that he will be elated and not incensed and angered and outraged. But he says, I'm outraged by the Supreme Court's decision as a pro-choice pastor. That means you're pro-murder. But his tweet says, as a, as a pro-choice pastor, I'll never back down from this fight. Women must be able to make their own health care decisions, not politicians. And, and, and if you think that abortion is health care, it is not. Abortion is not health care. We, we know that to be a fact. It is not health care by any stretch of the imagination. It is not health care. So when people like Damon Richardson support this guy, he supports Raphael Warnock. Then you have to ask yourself the question. Are these people genuinely saved? Are these people true Christians? Are these people true followers of Christ? Because true followers of Christ do not practice sin as a pattern of life and, not, and neither and nor do they encourage others to do so. We're to expose sin. We're, we're not to revel in it. We're not to encourage others to, to sin in the process as well. We're called to be holy. Imperfect as we are, it does not change what God has commanded us to be, and that is holy. I wanted to read this as well because this is the Hippocratic Oath. This is what doctors take prior to or just before they enter into their field. And most physicians and medical doctors, they know this because they have to state it. But I want to give you the history behind this. The Hippocratic Oath, quote, the Hippocratic Oath is perhaps the most widely known of Greek medical texts. It requires a new physician to swear upon a number of healing gods that he will be that he will uphold a number of professional ethical standards. It is strongly it also strongly, excuse me, binds the student to his teacher and the greater community of physicians with responsibilities similar to that of a family member. In fact, the creation of the oath may have marked the early stages of medical training to those outside the first families of Hippocratic medicine. The Asipliads of Kos by requiring strict loyalty. Over the centuries, it has been rewritten and often in order to suit the values of different cultures influenced by Greek medicine. Contrary to popular belief, the Hippocratic Oath is not required by most modern medical schools, although some have adopted modern versions that may suit or that suit many in the profession in the 21st century. It also does not explicitly contain the phrase first do no harm, which is commonly attributed to it. So here's the Hippocratic Oath. But look at some of the implications and statements behind this behind this document. Quote, it says, I swear by Apollo, the physician and Asclepius and Hagia and Panacea and all the gods and goddesses as my witness that according to my ability and judgment, I would keep this oath and this contract. To hold him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to be a partner in life with him and to fulfill his needs when required, to look upon his offspring as equals to my own siblings and to teach them 
this art if they shall wish to learn it without fee or contract and that by the set rules lectures and every other mode of instruction i will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons and those of my teachers and to students bound by this contract and having sworn this oath to the law of medicine but to no others I will use those dietary regimens which will benefit my patients according to my greatest ability and judgment, and I will do no harm or injustice to them. I will not give a lethal drug to anyone if I am asked, nor will I advise such a plan. And similarly, I would not give a woman a pessary to cause an abortion. In purity and according to divine law, will I carry out my life and my art. I will not use the knife even upon those suffering from stones. But will I will leave this to those who are trained in this craft. And to whatever homes I go, I will enter them for the benefit of the sick, avoiding any voluntary act of impropriety or corruption, including the seduction of women or men, whether they are free men or slaves. Whatever I see or hear in the lives of my patients, whether in connection with my profession practice or not, which ought not to be uh, be spoken of outside, I will keep secret as considering all such things to be private. So long as I maintain this oath faithfully and without corruption, may it be granted to me to partake of, of life fully and the practice of my art, gaining the respect of all men for all time. However, should I transgress this oath and violate it, may the opposite be my fate. Which is again why i i'm i'm just shocked somewhat because now the longer as i live you know the longer i live I, some things shouldn't shock me anymore i guess disappointed at times um how people can just flip or they try to justify murdering babies murdering babies it, it, it's, it's amazing to me never ceases to amaze me um let's uh let's ask this question let me just ask this question can a pastor i mean can a pastor be so brazen i guess in their in their views that they will twist the scriptures like damon richardson has done and then claim that they are standing on biblical principles of God's word and are teaching other people to stand on the principles of God's word. But when it comes to the issue of abortion, when it comes to the issue of murdering babies, can you or I call these people to be faithful shepherds of, of the Lord? Let's see what the scriptures teach. Because I believe God's word has a standard and is the standard. So I want to look at, again, Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. What, what, what are you equipping your people to do, Damon? To believe that it's okay to murder babies if they don't look desirable to you or to them? I mean, what makes what makes them any different than than Rome in the first century? I mean, think about it. What makes them any different? What makes them any different when if it wasn't a boy and it was a girl, they would kill it? I mean, the mentality is still the same. And it goes back into what we see these little ones to be. If we don't see them as image bearers of God and if we just see them as nothing, then we're going to treat them like that. So what are you equipping? What are you teaching your people to do? The Bible says we're to equip the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. We can't build up the body of Christ if we're killing off our offspring. Just saying. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by our waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Maybe that's you, Damon. 
because you spoke some crafty words in your video. And again, I don't know if those in your chat and your mods were were pushing back on your statements. I didn't see any. People were agreeing with you. The craftiness and deceitful scheming and speaking you were doing. But if we're going to be God's shepherds, God's under shepherds, then he, he, he's called us to protect. Like he, he said, you said that's us up to protect the flock. Well, yeah, that's true. But what happens when pastors that are to protect the flock aren't doing that? Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. He says, I know after my departure, Paul, saw, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you, not outside. We have, we have wolves inside. The war knocks and the, and the William Murphy's. Maybe you are a wolf too, Damon. If you're not protecting the, the flock yeah you can speak out against smoking weed like you did with jamal bryant who is another wolf but you're saying it's okay to murder babies while at the same time saying you don't support abortion because it's immoral which one is it which one is it because to take the life of a baby because it doesn't look right then that means you don't you don't believe your own words you do believe that abortion is justified. No one has just pushed your logic, that's all, and pressed you to think it through. But Paul says, verse 29, I, I know that after my departure, Sabbath wolves will come in among you and not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And that's what I see going on. Men like you and others drawing away disciples after yourselves. I mean, there's other way around it. You, you're no dummy. You said you're not a simpleton, right? Then what are you? If, if you can spew this and it goes unchecked, then what agenda are you following? See, I'm not talking about Warnock and, and Walk. I'm, I'm talking to, to people like you now, Damon. What, what are you following? Who, who's your what is your standard now? Because it looks like your standard has changed. But again, you could be a useful idiot. You, you could be following the agenda of Margaret Sanger, hook, line and sinker. And, and maybe you don't realize maybe you do. or Maybe you just thought that nobody was going to call you on it. Well, time's up. You're getting called on it. You're getting called on it. So. What I want to do is um, I want to read I want to read read this 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 portion of this book, and I have some um, I have some highlights I want to want to share with you in that. This is an American Dilemma, the book of American Dilemma is by author Gunnar, uh, Gunnar Murdahl, Gunnar Murdahl. And he writes the Negro, the growth of the Negro population in chapter seven. He says, quote, there are about 17 times as many Negroes in the United, in the United States in 1940 as there were in 1790 when the first census was taken. But in the same period, the white population increased 37 times. Negroes were 19.3% of the American population in 1790, but only 9.8% in 1940. Do you see what's going on with this? The numbers have dropped. The numbers have dropped. I mean, and, and, and we may ask ourselves, how did these numbers drop? And how, how are we now 13% uh, uh, fluctuating sometimes to 12% of the American population? When in 1790, we were 19%. 19.3% in 1790. But now, we're 12 to 13%. Can't blame it on police shooting unarmed black people. Can't blame it on that. 
we can't blame it on black on black crime. That's taking a lot of our people. A lot. But you know what's taking the majority of our people? It's not even black on black crime more than it is abortion. And that's self-induced. That's self-induced. Black on black crime is self-induced, but the abortion industry is taking industry is taking more of our people and we're letting them do it. Hosea says, my people perish for lack of knowledge in Hosea 4, 6. My people perish for lack of knowledge. And the, and the problem, the problem comes when we don't challenge these things and then ask ourselves the questions, why? why? Why is it that we have people in our churches supporting the murder and the destruction of our own our own kind. There's a spiritual agenda, there's a satanic agenda, and Satan has his useful idiots. And who are these useful idiots? You're about to find out in a moment. Let me go to, to the next highlight here. Just want to read some highlighted portions for you. Just want you to get the, the, the gist of this here. Is that we forget about the, the means for the moment and consider only the quali quantitative goal for Negro population policy, there is no doubt that the overwhelming majority of white Americans desire that there be as few Negroes as possible in America. If the Negroes could be eliminated from America or greatly de decreased in numbers, this would meet the whites' approval, provided that it could be accomplished by means which are also approved. Correspondingly, an increase of the portion proportion of Negroes in the American population is commonly looked upon as undesirable. These opinions are seldom expressed publicly. Commonly, it is considered a great misfortune for America that Negro slaves were ever imported. The presence of Negroes in America today is usually considered as a plight of the nation and particularly of the South. Page 170. Says a high death rate is an unhumanitarian and undemocratic way to restrict the Negro population and, in addition, expensive to society and dangerous to the white population. The only possible way of decreasing Negro population is by means of controlling fertility. The fact that most whites would not, excuse me, the fact that most whites would want to decrease the Negro population, particularly the lower class Negroes, would strengthen the argument for sterilization of destitute Negroes. We find, however, that such proposals, if they are made at all, are almost repugnant to the average white American in the South and the North as to the Negro. In general, he is not inclined to consider sterilization as a means of birth control except to prevent the reproduction of the feeble-minded, the insane, and the severely malformed. Do, do you hear this? So people, again, I want you all to hear this. Because this is exactly what Damon Richardson is saying is biblically acceptable, without scripture, by the way. It says, in general, listen, in general, he is not inclined to consider sterilization as means of birth control except to prevent the reproduction of the feeble-minded, the insane, and the severely malformed when a hereditary causation can be shown. Outside of those rare cases, he is against sterilization, even if entirely voluntary. For this, he gives not only the reason that in many regions of the South, for politi the political and judicial system, it's such that for Negroes and perhaps other poor people, a system of voluntary sterilization might in practice turn out to be compulsory. His resistance goes deeper. He reacts against the idea that any individual, for reasons which have no biological but only social causes, should undergo an unnatural restriction of his procreative possibilities. 
Outside the narrow field of, ne of negative e eugenics, sterilization is therefore excluded as a means of controlling fertility, except for individual cases in which life or health is threatened by childbearing. The average American takes a similar attitude toward induced abortion. In his opinion, life should not be extinguished. Abortion, further, is not entirely free from health risks. The type of birth control which we shall have to discuss as a means of population policy is thus for all practical purposes restricted to contraception. To contraception. Under their sanction, birth control facilities should be extended relatively more to Negroes than to whites. Since Negroes are more concentrated in the lower income and educational classes, and since they now know less about modern techniques of birth control. The relative absence of Roman Catholics in the South, the great attention recently of the birth control organizations to the South and the greater need of the South are important reasons for this. But it is it is reasonable to assume that the large number of undesired Negroes in the rural districts also has something to do with the lack of opposition on the part of the white South. Just, just highlighting the agenda, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it says here in the bottom of the footnote. As we observed in the previous sections of this chapter, Southerners will never publicly admit that they would like to see the Negro population decrease. But they do point to the poverty that could be avoided if there were fewer Negroes. Another indication that the presence of the Negroes is the main reason for the lack of opposition to birth control in the South is that despite the lack of opposition to it, birth control is taboo as a subject for public or polite conversation, even more in the South than in the North. Most of the 452 privately supported birth control clinics in the United States in 1942 were under the sponsorship of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America or its local affiliates. Most of these are in cities. The Harlem section of New York got a clinic in 1930. The Federation with funds made available by a white philanthropist is conducting two demonstration projects important to Negroes. One is in urban Nashville, Tennessee, and the other in rural Berkeley County, South Carolina. Both projects are for Negroes only. The Federation has a division of Negro service whose primary function is educational, aided by a National Negro Advisory Council of 34 eminent Negro leaders. It works through the Urban Leagues, Negro doctors and nurses, the National Hospital Association, the Negro Press and Negro Club Women. Some 200 of the Negro, ge ne Negro Gion's uh, teachers have re has requested information of the Federation's division of Negro service as have hundreds of South of Southern white health officers and doctors. A more serious difficulty is that of educating Southern Negroes to the advantages of birth control. Negroes on the whole have all the prejudices against it that other poor, ignorant, superstitious people have. More serious is the fact that even when they do accept it, they are not very efficient in obeying instructions, and sometimes they come to feel that it is a fake. An intensive educational campaign is needed, giving special recognition to the prejudices and ignorance of the people whom the campaign is to benefit. The use of Negro doctors and nurses is essential. It is true that they seek to reach the masses of Negroes through the urban leagues, Negro newspapers, jeans teachers, and Negro club women. Now, I want to I want to read to you just two uh, footnotes in the same book. Very telling information.
Bear with me. All right. This part right here. George S. Schuler, a Negro journalist, makes the following comments, quote, there is no great opposition to birth control among the 12 million brown Americans. Certainly none has been expressed in writing. On the contrary, one encounters everywhere a profound interest in and desire for information on contraceptive methods, am methods among them. Negroes are perhaps more receptive to this information than white folk. Despite their vaunted superiority, the white brethren have a full quota of illusions and one might say hypocrisies, especially about anything dealing with sex. Brown Americans are somewhat different because they have been forced to face uh, more frankly, more frankly, the hard facts of life. No wonder one sometimes hears a colored woman say it's a sin to bring a black child into the world. If anyone should doubt the desire on the part of Negro women and men to limit their families, it is only necessary to note the large scale of preventive devices sold in every drugstore in the various black belts and the great number of abortions performed by medical men and quacks. Further indirect evidence of the desire for family li limitation among Negroes can be presented. There is reason to believe, if one is willing to accept the almost universal testimony of Negro physicians that birth control is a, is a sort is being attempted on a wide scale among the lower class of Negroes. Negro women in formidable numbers without the advantage of contraceptive information seek relief through abortions performed under highly dangerous conditions. And then on page 1227 in the footnotes, it says the facts of this paragraph have been greatly provided by Miss Florence Rose of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, August 21st, 1942. For discussion of these prejudices against Negroes, see an address given by Dr. Dorothy Bolding Freerby, Planned Parenthood as a public health measure for the Negro race, delivered at the annual meeting of the Birth Control Federation of America, January 29th, 1942. Dr. Freerby lists the popular objections as one, the concept that when birth control is proposed to them, it is motivated by a clever bit of machination to persuade them to commit race suicide. Two, the so-called uh, the so-called husband objection, which Dr. Robert E. Sebos of the South Carolina Rural Project observes, quote, is often blamed on physical reactions to the material, but apparently is related more to superstitious fear of impairment of function through interference with the vital process. Three, the fact that birth control is confused with abortion. <laughs> And for the belief that it is inherently immoral. For studies showing the greater inefficiency of Negro women and using contraceptives, pearl the national, the natural history of population. On the other hand, the Planned Parenthood Federation's experiment in Berkeley County, South Carolina, led to the conclusion that, quote, 80 percent of the contacted population of Negroes of low income and low intelligence level will use pregnancy spacing methods when this is properly presented to them. After two years of the Federation's project at Nashville, 58 percent of the 610 patients instructed use the methods prescribed consistently and successfully. Now, I want to read this last portion of this book. Um, if you don't have this, I've talked about this before. The Negro Project. The Negro Project. Blues Flurry. There's some sections in this book I would like to read to you, for the record, showing you that Planned Parenthood's agenda has always been to use black people to get rid of black people, and particularly in the black church to get rid of black people. Because they know that black people's 
influence or people being influenced comes mainly through the black church. And we see that occurring even today. I mean, you have all of these politicians going to the black church trying to get the black vote. And who are these policies? Oh, and who are these uh, politicians rather pushing these these murderous policies? Democrats. And they go to the black church and the black church follows it. And you have people like Terry Anderson, having people like Al, Al Sharpton, who is a proponent of not just abortion, but same sex, quote unquote, marriage. So what message does that send? It sends a bad message. But these are the useful idiots that Margaret Sanger talks about. Um, I'll read portion here. I'll read this portion here. Demographers have determined through long and exhaustive research that 2.1 live births per female is the minimum number required for people to survive, let alone thrive. But when the inordinate abortion rate among black women combined with premature deaths from other causes, that is disease, drug abuse and violent crime being among them, the replacement level in the black community is less than half that number. Abortion is the leading cause of death in black America, eclipsing all others by a substantial margin. Abortion wipes out the lives of unborn black children to the tune of nearly 500,000 every year. Moreover, most of Planned Parenthood's abortion clinics are located in the black inner city. A fact that can hardly be called a coincidence. These numbers are so alarming that the Reverend Walter Hoy, whose ministry is based in Oakland, California, has stated that if, if this trend continues, the black race in America will in effect become extinct by the turn of the 22nd century. This is exactly what Sanger had feared that some of the more rebellious members of the black community just might figure out the true purpose of the birth control movement as it is applied to them. Thus the need for black ministers to step in and straighten out said members. One such member, one such one such minister who bought into this strategy was Dr. Adam Clayton Powell, senior of the Abyssinian Baptist Church, who invited Sanger to address his congregation. Sanger presented her program packaging birth control in the positive language of, quote, unquote, better health. Helping families to space out, quote, unquote, the births of their children to assist in the mother's recovery, etc. But many members weren't buying it. Powell received harsh criticism from one unnamed minister who was surprised that he'd allowed that awful woman in his church. God always has a remnant. Another member of the black clergy who was to put mildly suspicious of Sanger's motives, but who became an unwitting dupe was J.T. Braun, the editor in chief of the National Baptist Sunday School Publishing Board in Nashville, Tennessee. In a letter he sent to Sanger on December 8th, 1941, two years after she had launched the Negro Project, he expressed his very deep concerns about birth control, telling her, quote, the very idea of such a thing has always held the greatest hatred and contempt in my mind, end quote. He implied, however, that his mind remained open on this subject by adding, quote, I am hesitant to give my full endorsement of this idea until you send me perhaps some more convincing literature on this subject. In other words, give me a reason. Sanger seized on this opportunity in two ways. First, she sent him a pamphlet on the subject of from the Federal Council of Churches, Marriage and Home Committee two weeks later on December 22nd. It endorsed her position and was enthusiastically supported by David Sims, pastor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and a member of the ABCL's and National Negro Advisory Board. Sims sought to relieve Braun's angst by writing, quote, there are some who believe that birth control is an attempt to dictate to families how many children should, they should have. Nothing could be further from the truth. This assurance seemed to have quelled any lingering misgivings that Braun may have had. And just in case that wasn't enough, Sanger sent along more material in favor of BCFA's position, along with a copy of her autobiography, which he gave to his wife to read. Sanger's hidden agenda, 
cloaked in the stated objective of improving women's health and lowering the rate of infant mortality had the desired effect on both the reader and her husband. Braun relented and allowed his church to be used as a forum to promote birth control. He later wrote Sanger of his experience telling her that, quote, at first glance, I had a horrible shock to the proposition because it seemed to me to be allied to abortion. But after careful thought and prayer, I have concluded that it is sometimes necessary to save the lives of mother and children. Sound familiar? In addition to Braun, black leaders from all fields were taken in, such as the sociologist and author W.E.B. Du Bois, who was also a founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. Charles A. Barnett, director of the Associated Negro Press in Chicago, Charles S. Johnson, president of Fisk University, Eugene Nickel Jones, executive director of the National Urban League, Dr. Dorothy Bolding Ferraby, president of Alpha Kappa Alpha. Remember that name? Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, president of the National Council of Negro Women and many others. They all bought into Sanger's seductive message, never once questioning either her stated views on race or her association with the likes of Knopp, Stoddard, or Dr. Laughlin, all of whom, as noted in, in these earlier pages, were avowed racists and members of Sanger's American Birth Control League. But let us now turn briefly to Dr. Clarence J. Gamble, the heir to the Procter and Gamble Soap Company, and a key partner in and financial backer of the Negro Project. In a 1939 memo he sent to Sanger, he had expressed concerns that some blacks would see the plan for what it was and attempt to exterminate the black race eugenically. And she agreed that it would be wise to, quote, train the Negro doctor at the clinic, presumably the one set up by the ABCL in Harlem in order to go out among blacks with enthusiasm and knowledge, which will have far reaching effects among the colored people. It was in this reply to Gamble that she made her infamous proposal to use the black minister to straighten out those rebellious members of their congregations, lest they discover that really lay behind their scheme. The far reaching effects that Sanger set in motion would forever remain her legacy and the black community would, in the end, pay dearly for it. Margaret Sanger died in Tucson, Arizona on September 6, 1966, and was buried in Fishkill, New York. It is often said that a person should be judged based on the totality of their actions. Margaret Sanger is to be treated no differently in this regard. She is seen in elite circles as a pioneer in the fight for women's rights, particularly their reproductive freedom, which is nothing more than the manufactured right to an abortion at any time and in any place right up to the moment of birth under the United States Constitution. Never mind that this right can be found nowhere in this document. Sanger is memorialized by having several public buildings named after her in every year since her passing. Planned Parenthood, ostensibly American, a, a woman's health organization, but which in reality is the nation's largest private abortion provider with $540.6 million in tax money flowing into its coffers in 2013, issues its Margaret Sanger Award. The Maggie, as it is sometimes called, is presented to those individuals of distinction and recognition of excellence in leadership and furthering reproductive health and reproductive rights. It is often pointed out by her adherents that Sanger herself was opposed to abortion because she considered it the taking of a life. This may be true as far as it goes, but if such, if such is the case, why then is Planned Parenthood performing procedures she herself found to be so reprehensible? And why is it that so many black ministers, politicians, business leaders, media representatives, etc., are so supportive of the goals of Planned Parenthood? Margaret Sanger is, in many ways, the patron saint of birth, birth control and abortion, largely due to the fact that very few of those who know better have either the inclination or the will to take a good look at this woman and what she came to represent. A culture of death that pervades seemingly every aspect of our society. This is especially true of too many of our so-called black leaders, 
too many of whom are too often willfully blind to the racist eugenic agenda that drove Sanger and her disciples. The same people who rightfully condemn the actions of the Ku Klux Klan say nothing of the fact that this woman not only had direct dealings with this group, she put, as we have seen in these pages, avowed racists on the board of directors of her American Birth Control League. They ignore the fact that she was an avid supporter of Malthusian eugenics and social Darwinism, and they gloss over or refuse to acknowledge that she was an anti-religious bigot who belittled people of faith for their beliefs regarding charity and the sanctity of unborn human life. Margaret Sanger did not come into this world as an evil person. No one does, not even Hitler, Stalin, or Mao. Evil, like good, is a learned behavior. Sanger's work as a nurse was based on a genuine desire to do something about the dangerous and often fatal conditions women faced at childbirth. She also wanted to help these women avoid the same fate that befell her mother and very nearly took her own life, all of which was quite laudable and very commendable. She had the best of intentions, but as the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And Sanger's racism, her religious bigotry, and her adherence to the ideals to ideas of the radical left in the early 1900s, which have been cited here, as well as her dealings with eugenists, both in the United States and in other countries, all serve to effectively destroy whatever good works she performed earlier in her life. By the time the ABCL had changed its name to Planned Parenthood Federation of America in 1942, the Negro Project was in full swing, supported and promoted with the unwitting participation and of prominent black Americans from the clergy whom Sanger had targeted from the outset, academia, healthcare professionals, financiers, media, and just about everyone in between. Sanger has snookered them so well with her stated goal of helping them improve their health and by limiting the number of children they, could, they would bear do their part in contributing to the financial stability of their families. But the real hidden agenda, though not as apparent at the time, would then one day wreak untold havoc on an entire group of Americans. And for one simple reason, those behind it saw many of their fellow citizens as inferior simply because of the color of their skin. Most of all of those who refer to themselves as our so-called black leaders, after all, the Negro Project was directed at this segment of the population. Therefore, the onus is on these leaders to demand a full accounting so that the facts surrounding this disgraceful and disturbing chapter in our history can be laid bare for all to see. Only then can the healing truly begin. I just want you to hear what she, her plan was. Her plan's always been that. Useful idiots. Useful idiots. And she has a whole trove of them. A treasure trove of them. And so again, Damon, my question to you is how how, how do you how can you support a person like Raphael Warnock and claim that you don't support abortion, but you you vote for a man who does. I mean, he he made it clear. His goal is to re-overturn Roe. I don't know if y'all remember this story. I, I, I played this on one of the, on a prior video, on previous videos uh, before. 17,000 found in Jewish abortionist's backyard in 1981. Just read you a short excerpt of this. In 1981, a pathologist by the name of Malvin Weisberg was found to be storing 17,000 aborted bodies on his residential property, stored at a room temperature in a shipping container, his garage, and throughout his house. He had acquired the bodies between 1976 and 1981. Marvin had also been actively defrauding both the state of California and federal governments to perform illegal pathology tests on the bodies. What was the fallout of all of this? A two year court case by the Jewish ACLU to prevent Christians from burying the bodies. During which time all the bodies were left to sit in another steel storage container again at room temperature. 
Marvin Weisberg was not charged for defrauding the government and no further investigation was done to determine why he was squirreling away aborted bodies in mass or why a large portion of them were in shipping containers in the first place. Was that even the first shipping container he had, he had filled? Was he even planning to dispose of the bodies? Seventeen thousand bodies, babies. Seventeen thousand image bearers. You know, Damon. The, these these image bearers may some of them may I probably have were deformed. According to you, it doesn't matter, right? In 1982, approximately 17,000 babies were found in a repossessed storage container in Los Angeles. Same story. The babies, many among whom were over 20 weeks gestation, were stored by a medical lab which received aborted babies from several states. A report by the Leader Post quotes then spoke person for the district attorney office, Al Abrigate, stating, saying, quote, they said between five and seven were possibly viable or could have survived outside the mother's womb. I want to just play a clip. Well, as a supervisor for the county of Los Angeles, we found out through the through the media that 17,000 infants had been uh, stored in a container. So we asked for an investigation by the district attorney in the coroner's office. We found approximately 190 were over 20 weeks of age. I think some as as long as uh, as old as 25, 27 weeks. Uh, Mr. Antonovich contacted Mr. Gutierrez. Glenn Wong is a funeral director for a major Los Angeles mortuary. Uh, ask us uh, to go ahead and handle the burial of the fetuses. How I came involved was uh, they were asking if it were possible to have anyone photograph these fetuses, and I so happened to be also a photographer. How many fetuses were actually involved in the autopsies? Uh, there were approximately about 40, 44, uh, if I'm correct. And why were the autopsies performed? Uh, they were to find out why um, or what was the reason of the cause of death. That wasn't apparent? Um, apparently not. Now, I've seen some of these fetuses and believe me, they were apart. There were some where the uh, eyes were bulging and some where the uh, chest cavity was ripped open. I do remember one was where I saw a hand and a feet all apart. So it was kind of like the hands were intact, the feet were intact, and everything else was more like uh, just a little potpourri of everything and that's that was it that kind of turned me just wanted to play the portion we and I'll, I'll put this at the um uh, in the in the description below but just want to say this if you can watch this kind of video and watch this kind of stuff and still think that it's okay to murder babies you're not saved your your heart is darkened your mind has no sense of conviction and your your love there is none for fellow image bearers like babies and so again you know we can we can try to act as though one issue voting is not important when it is a life and death situation it is because, again, can a murderer who lives a life of sin, unrepented sin, enter the, sin of kingdom of, enter the kingdom of heaven? The Bible says you can't. You must repent. You must turn from your sin. You must be born again. And again, this does not mean that if you have, if you have uh, had an abortion or paid for an abortion, that that is the un unpardonable sin. No, by God's grace, you can be forgiven. Just like with any other sin that we commit, if we truly repent and turn from our sin, God will forgive us. We need to plea for God's mercy. So I don't I don't want those of you who may watch this video and may have done something like this to feel that God cannot use you. Number one, that God uh, does not love you, that God does not want you saved. You fall before the mercy of God and ask for God to, to forgive you and save you.
and by God's grace, he will. But we cannot ignore this blatant, ungodly, inexcusable act for the sake of convenience. For the sake of convenience, that's not that's not love. Love is always other centered, always other centered. Um, wanted to put this counter up. To this date, here's the abortion clock. Here's the abortion clock. As of this date. Eighteen hundred ninety nine babies have been aborted today since Roe v. Wade in 1973. Sixty four point two over sixty four point two million by Planned Parenthood. Nine million since 1970 over nine million by Planned Parenthood this year. Three hundred and fifty three thousand black babies since 1973 over 19 million. Over 19 million. And again, someone had requested that black a black baby counter be be mentioned or added to this, and that's why they did it. Why do we include a black baby counter? Two African American religious based websites asked us to put in a black baby counter to highlight the disparity of the high number of abortions in the black population. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, had eliminating her view of undesirables as an objective in her eugenics plan. You will find many large Planned Parenthood clinics in the inner cities. Again, you will find many large Planned Parenthood clinics in the inner cities. In other words, in the hood. That is not a coincidence. That is a calculated, premeditated plan. And we have the useful idiots helping to do that. These are these are some of the things that that you, uh, Damon, you support your candidate on abortion on demand. He supports abortion on demand. I'm just looking at the moral stuff. Protect girls sports. He doesn't. He don't. He don't want to protect girls sports. He 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 believes girls and boys can 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 get into wrestling and boxing and and all kind of stuff together. And they 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 can compete against men and men against women. School choice. That's a moral issue. He believes that the government should be able to teach our kill our, our children. Herschel says no. It's the parents' responsibility to teach their children. Not only that, but it's the parents' responsibility to, to to decide whether or not their children should be educated by the state or by other private sectors. Just you know. He doesn't want to build the wall, that kind of stuff. But this is who you voted for, Damon. And I guess my question is, when, when are we going to hold people like Damon Richardson and, and other pastors responsible when they publicly come forward and say that they are supporting wicked men? I'll close with one verse. I'll present it one more time here. Proverbs 28, verse 4. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. So, yes, I strive, I fight with those who forsake God's law and not only forsake God's law, but cause others to forsake it too. The black church, as we know it, yes, it is. It is in grave danger. I mean, who are, who are we seeking to please? 
a culture that is leading our people into hell? Or are we seeking to please the one who saved us and called us out of darkness into his marvelous light? I can't make that decision for you. You need to make it for yourself. When you see stuff like this, people publicly endorsing, publicly supporting wicked leaders and their wicked policies, it's time to draw a line in the sand and say this far, no further. So I think I'm done. Uh, if you like this video, please share it. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments or you can email me, sickowizardyow.com. Again, if you'd like to support the ministry finance, you can do that through the donation information uh, located below. I'll put the resources and information to the uh, the links that I had shared uh, at the bottom of this video as well, too. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for your support and for your time. Again, hopefully I will be getting this Wi-Fi situation straight uh, in the upcoming days and we'll be able to have more online and lively and uh, live discussions, uh, if you will. But thank you so much for watching. You guys have a great day and have a blessed week. And you know the drill. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You still here? It's over. Go home.